Uh, hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to Massey's uh, Senior Fellow Luncheon, and we will be having several events coming in the future months. At the outset, both individually and collectively, we would like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Vandat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across the Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, learn, and teach on their land. We are honored to host Dr. Rita Shelton Deverell on the occasion of the Black History Month at the Massey College Senior Fellow Luncheon. An eminent Canadian and a member of the Order of Canada, Dr. Rita, Rita Deverell was born in Houston, Texas and immigrated to Canada in 1967 and begun an inspiring career in broadcasting in 1972 as the producer of a children's program. In 1974, she joined the CBC as the host for the Take 30 program. Dr. Deverell is the a founder of the Vision TV and has held senior positions there, including the network anchor. She has also served as the head of the news and current affairs at the Aboriginal People's Television Network. She is the founding chair of the Advisory Board of Canadian Multicultural Radio, has served as an ad adjudicator at large for the Canadian Broadcast Standards Council, and is the Media Awareness Network board member. With a PhD from OISE, next door, Dr. Rita Deverell was a tenured professor and acting director of the University of Regina's School of Journalism. In addition to several visiting professorship, Dr. Deverell is on the Maclean's Honor Roll of Outstanding Canadians, is in the Canadian Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame, and is a two-time Gemini Award winner. Today, Dr. Rita Shelton Deverell will be speaking on the inspiring book, American Refugees Turning to Canada for Freedom, which I think should be a compulsory reading for all Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, thank you for the invitation, and thank you for the uh, compulsory uh, reading boost. Uh, I, I have shortened my own bio to say, until I was 30, I was an actor, and until I was 60, I was a broadcaster who dropped in and out of academe, and since 60, I do everything at the same time. <laughs> so there, there it is, folks. Um, I will uh, underline, though, that I uh, immigrated to Canada in 1967, which uh, some of you may remember was centennial year, uh, and that I was born in 1945 in the Houston, Texas Negro Hospital, and I grew up in the same black ghetto as George Floyd, and we went to the same high school. Um, in spite of growing up in the same blocks from each other, um, I had, for many reasons, a much more privileged upbringing than George Floyd 40 years later. 
um, that's to locate me <laughs> in, a, in, in a different way. Um, the book, American Refugees Turning to Canada for Freedom, uh, 2019, has a much longer history and a, a totally unexpected history for me. Um, when I started on that kind of idea, it was 40 years before that. And um, the, the woman who was inspiring me to think this is a, a topic, there is a chapter on the woman whose name is Florence James. Uh, so at this point, I was in Saskatchewan. And I was in Saskatchewan because the theater there had hired me as an actor in 1971, which was an incredibly progressive step for Canadian theater at that moment. Um, but the Globe Theater in Regina hired me. This is before I fell into media. Um, and I did a tour of the Saskatchewan schools with that company. So I was in every small town uh, in Saskatchewan. And Florence James, the woman I'm talking about, was a very elderly woman sitting in the back of the rehearsal hall when we were rehearsing before we went on tour. And it took me a while to figure out who she was, because nobody told me is the main reason. Uh, she and her husband had founded the Seattle Repertory Playhouse, uh, been blacklisted by the Washington State Committee on Un-American Activities, and the University of Washington, uh, you may know, uh, fired uh, six tenured professors because the committee asked them to. This was basically the, the reason. Um, the theater that Florence and her husband ran, um, the, the building was expropriated by the university. Uh, this broke the, they're in their 60s at this point. Uh, the husband died and Florence immigrated to Saskatchewan as the first drama consultant of the Saskatchewan Arts Board, which predates the Canada Council as an arm's length arts funding agency. So the Saskatchewan Arts Board was built under the Tommy Douglas government uh, because that government said a place that didn't have full electricity needed an arts board. So there is my woman in her 60s uh, coming from Seattle where it's kind of balmy to Saskatchewan where it's very cold and she is going to every small town and she was never happier. What my little brain figured out finally is that there were these outstanding people in Saskatchewan who had fled from repressive governments to the progressive government of Saskatchewan. So this is what I finally figured out 40 years ago. And um, I tried to write a book about Florence. Um, and I did come up with a, a draft. Um, but nothing happened. and. Um, and then I fell into broadcasting, and then Vision TV got a license. And then I'm working uh, day and night and night and day for this television network that has no money. Um, so it wasn't until I was 60 and stopped being a full-time broadcaster that I went back to the story, uh, the story of Florence. And by this time, I was uh, then converting to uh, the, the concept that's in the book. So the book um, has about 13 people in it 
who are all uh, actual uh, the people who immigrated are descendants of the people who immigrated, um, uh, including uh, United Empire loyalists, uh, some of whom are uh, white in the book and some of whom are black, which uh, is usually a surprise to um, most Canadians. So I'm going to read you just a little bit um, and, and then uh, stop talking. I'll read you um, from the, the very beginning, which will uh, bring you up to uh, 2015 from uh, 40 years ago. Uh, so the first uh, chapter is called Allegiance to All Her Heirs and Successors, a Canadian Citizenship Ceremony, 2017. This is not a fantasy. This is the truth. On July 14, 2017, I stood in front of a packed courtroom in Scarborough, Ontario, wearing a black robe, about to swear in 98 new Canadian citizens. Behind me was the royal coat of arms, known formally as the arms of Her Majesty the Queen in right of Canada. Those of us who are not citizenship judges, a paid job, but have the authority to be voluntary presiding officers, in my case, because I'm a member of the Order of Canada, are actually called eminent Canadians. I have a couple of friends who have presided at the ceremony, and they warned me that it was an emotional experience. One said she completely lost it and sobbed while administering the oath of Canadian citizenship. I quipped, I'm an actor, and I only cry when paid to do so. <laughs> Wrong. I got through administering the oath in English in a firm, confident voice. In French, I wasn't so assured, but didn't have time to cry while worrying about pronunciation. I thought I was home free. Wrong. It was shaking each individual's hand, presenting the new Canadian citizens with their citizenship certificates and saying, welcome to Canada, that got to me. Since these words were simply said to one person at a time, maybe they didn't notice that I was tearing up. Plus, what to say to each new citizen in the, uh, is the presiding officer's decision. And I didn't think that my choice would bring on my tears until it happened. How on earth and in heaven did I get to be the person saying, welcome to Canada? How did I suddenly, it seemed, almost by magic, become the presiding officer who had the power, the right, the permission, the responsibility to say those three words? I certainly never dreamed of imminence in 1967 when I immigrated to Canada. In fact, I just hoped to cross the border safely via the Peace Bridge between Buffalo, New York and Fort Erie, Ontario. In the station wagon, stuffed with wedding gifts, rented by my just married, born in Canada groom, have a seat. <laughs> uh, sorry you've missed the lovely food. <laughs> One sometimes misses the lovely food. I certainly uh, was chasing a brand new, hopefully successful life in Canada, but imminence? Never in my wildest dreams could I have projected that 50 years later, a little black girl from the American South would say, in the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I welcome you at the beginning of a citizenship ceremony. In much less heartwarming recent news, in the evening of November 8, 2016, as it became clear 
that Donald Trump would be President of the United States, the website of Citizenship and Immigration Canada crashed. Although there had been many jokes during the long campaign about Americans moving to Canada if Trump won, this was no joke. The site was presumably overloaded with those seeking information on how to walk in the footsteps of earlier American refugees chasing the Canadian dream, some of whom we'll meet in this book. In the heat of this post-election moment, it might have appeared that something new and dramatic was happening. Actually, though, the website crash was the same old, same old with a cyber uh, space gloss on a 250-year-old story. American citizens and others resident or captive in the country that promotes itself as the freest, most prosperous, and most egalitarian in the universe were forced to que question whether they could remain there. The question has been raised many times before, from the Revolutionary War to the War of 1812, by travelers on the Underground Railroad, by victims of un-American activities trials during the Black Civil Rights Movement, by Vietnam War resistors, then by Iraq War resistors, and now could the Citizenship and Immigration Canada website searchers of 2016 stay in that country. So that's the introduction um, uh, to the book. And of course, you will, um, w when I said that the story is older than Loyalist, uh, that in part is what I was referring to, uh, the Revolutionary War to Trump. There are these waves of immigration. I'm going to read you a little bit more uh, which was the most controversial part of the book with my editors, uh, which was that I, uh, now, the editors were wonderful, uh, University of Regina Press, um, and, and they did a, a very fine job of telling me when I was not making any sense, um, and I appreciated it. They uh, made the, uh, my story is threaded throughout the book, and uh, that was in fact their idea that I uh, do that, and it was working very well. Uh, but here's where the wheels came off the editorial discussions. It was that I wanted to, to interject uh, an indigenous person. And they said, but that's not an American refugee. And I said, you, you really, I cannot talk about the Canadian-US border without talking about indigenous people. I just can't do it. So that was the one time <laughs> Uh, that I put my foot down and I thought the whole thing is going to just go off the rails over this. Uh, but I, of course, uh, meant it. So the person who is in the book, we, we finally uh, came to terms with that, um, is a, uh, a, a journalist named Dan David. Um, uh, Mohawk, who lives in uh, Ganesatagi, and I met Dan when he came to Regina in, well, this must have been in the late 1970s or 1980s. Um, he was a part of something CBC at that time called the Visible Minority Training Program. And I used to joke that CBC discovered visible minority people every five years and started again from the bottom rung. Um, 
I'm pleased to say, however, that last week uh, CBC unveiled its National Indigenous Strategy, which is, w was years in the making and is absolutely excellent. I digress. So Dan turns up in the CBC uh, newsroom in Regina, and at that point, uh, people still had typewriters. He would come back from lunch and he would find in his typewriter carriage uh, notes from his colleagues saying, go back where you came from. Um, it, it, so <laughs> somebody told Dan about me and said, maybe you could, uh, Rita Deverell can figure out how to make your life better. And uh, I was through, I, uh, what I did was to contact somebody very high in the bureaucracy who I knew would get rid of this problem. And uh, that worked. Uh, the person I contacted knocked a few heads and all of these bad things stopped happening, which says a l little bit about uh, the importance of leadership on these matters. Um, anyway, I um, uh, included Dan in the book, and um, I'll just read you uh, a little bit of this. Um, for Dan, his relationship with the border uh, similarly changed after he was awarded a Commonwealth Fellowship. He emerged from the life-changing events of Oka to learn that he was the recipient of the prestigious honor. Dan needed, tra needed travel documents to go to London to accept the prize, which included trips to several South Pacific nations of the Commonwealth and to be presented by Queen Elizabeth II in Buckingham Palace. Conflicting loyalties and broken promises were again part of the story and Dan explained it to me in an email. The main reason for my not taking a Canadian passport was the Canadian government's insistence that I renounce my Mohawk citizenship in order to do so. As an adult, I could have done so without much fuss, but Canada insisted I get my parents to sign sworn affidavits that they were Canadian as well. There was a choice to be made. In the end, another senior official in the Canadian government told me to just get the American passport, accept the fellowship, go to London, and don't worry because it will all be worked out. Once there, however, Canada changed its mind. I faxed a letter that night, the night before we were scheduled to go to Buckingham Palace, telling Canadian officials that I would rip up my American passport, go to the Times of London, and play them a tape of these senior Canadian government officials telling me to take a US passport, etc. I would declare myself stateless, a political refugee from Canada, and raise all kinds of hell internationally across Europe. Uh, that, that's Dan's email to me. Um, so then there is the background on his uh, grandfather, which is why this is so important to him. Uh, grandfather shows up unannounced at the gates of Buckingham Palace. He holds a petition in his hand. He wears his best cut English suit, double breasted suit with a handkerchief folded neatly in the breast pocket. A guard arrives to ask his business. Grandfather hands him a letter of introduction with his signature, Joseph K. Gabriel, in long flowing hand above the X's and names of the other chiefs of the Longhouse at Ganesatagi. But the king sends word he will not see my great-grandfather. The royal guard tells him he is not a British 
subject. He instructs my great-grandfather to go to the American embassy instead. Um, so Dan says, uh, that night I type the letter. I do the same thing my great-grandfather would have done. I fax the letter to Canada House. The next day, an official calls on me and says that my situation is causing some problems and embarrassment in Ottawa. Good, I say. After 1990, that means Oka, um, you don't think I'd really trust anybody from the Canadian government, do you? Whatever happens, I am my great-grandfather's granddaughter's son. I walk in his footsteps. I know he wants, finally, to be welcomed into Buckingham Palace. In the morning, I've got good news, an official of the Commonwealth tells me. You can complete your fellowship. You'll accompany us to our audience with the Queen tomorrow. The doors swing open. I stroll down the length of this huge room towards a little gray-haired woman in a summer dress. She looks surprisingly like my mother. I stop and nod. Are you some kind of an Indian? She asks in that familiar voice. Yes, I am, Your Majesty, I reply, slightly confused, pulling myself up to my full height. I'm from Canada. Oh, she continues, what kind of Indian are you? A Mohawk, I say. A mohawk, she says slightly. You're not one of those naughty mohawks, are you? I wait for a second before answering, yes, ma'am, I am. Um, so that's part of Dan's uh, story uh, that, uh, through arguments with the editors, uh, got into the book uh, because uh, we all have our experiences, but this experience is another unique part of the picture, and I definitely wanted it in the book. Um, so the book got written, the book got published, the book uh, did pretty well, um, and now we're in another era where there may be a candidate for the presidency of the United States with the name of Trump. The profile that I basically draw of everyone in the book is their own profile. It's not that they came to Canada, crossed the border, and any problems they ever had went away. That's not what happened. The point that uh, I am making, and the point that they are making, is because of their, in fact, <coughs> quite uh, radical devotion to Canada, when these American refugees see things happening in Canada that they think are a betrayal of Canadian values, they become very vocal about saying so. Um, I uh, had one colleague, uh, uh, born in Canada colleague, who said, I love being on committees with uh, uh, former Americans. And I said, oh, why? He said, well, they actually get things done. They want to accomplish the thing that the committee has set out to do. Whereas, he said, we seem to have ways of putting it off, whatever it is. Um, so that is, it's, it's, it's not that these uh, people, as I say, that all of their problems are solved and uh, they float up into heaven and, and that's, that's the answer. Um, so, 
I'll read you just uh, a tiny amount from the very end, from the uh, epilogue. Um, as I said to someone, I think, uh, in the, in the uh, common room, um, yes, I am no longer an American. And that story is, is, is in the book, and it's uh, long and fairly complicated. Uh, but I actually do have a certificate of loss of nationality, which I went to the jump through the hoops to obtain. Uh, and there were various reasons for that, uh, which I won't uh, uh, bore you with unless you ask. <laughs> Uh, but here's a bit from the end, um, the epilogue. The fears of those early immigration officials are coming true, it appears. The white Protestant Canada is definitely disappearing. An evolved Canada is emerging. At a recent ceremony where I was an observer, an indigenous elder said, paddle along beside me in your canoe find out about us. We have always welcomed you, and we still do. For the American refugees and immigrants in this book, there are serious concerns about Canada right now that must be addressed. Their complex vision of Canada includes maintaining a vibrant universal health care system, ensuring taxpayer support for the arts and cultural industries that foster Canadian content, seeking to be peacemakers and not warmongers in the world, including uh, welcoming res uh, resistors from the Iraq war and 25,000 Syrian refugees, and undertaking acknowledgement of and uh, tuition for uh, and, and restitution for uh, Canada's racist and colonial past and present, which applies most strongly to indigenous peoples, but also to persons of color. That Canada is better on all of these issues than the United States is why American expats have come here and stayed here. But better is not good enough. They are also activists who continue in their responsibility to help create uh, improvements in Canadian society. In spite of these difficulties, we born again Canadians view Canada as the best country in the world. Mistakes have been made and are being made now that must be acknowledged. With full acknowledgement of them, Canada will keep moving towards the best country label and will even achieve it from time to time. Um, right now, so that was what I wrote in uh, 2019. Uh, right now, I am uh, quite concerned uh, about some currents <laughs> in the Canadian atmosphere. And I actually, I made notes about this because I didn't want, th there are more than this, but some that are really bothering me at the moment um, is the notion that equity, diversity, and inclusion training is dangerous for our physical and mental health. There have been some murmurings that um, if a uh, new federal government is elected, it will be not legal for a workplace to say, people in this workplace need to have equity, diversity, and inclusion training. So that presumably would include the federal government, which seems to me ma rather amazing. I'm um, on the board of the CBC now, and as I constantly say, that's not because uh, my life with CBC has always been butterflies and rainbows. 
In fact, I filed a discrimination grievance against the CBC uh, in the 1980s. It's because <laughs> I believe in the institution of a public broadcaster. I strongly believe that. And I'm at the age and stage uh, where uh, that's what you use maturity for, <laughs> is uh, to work on, on policy. So um, um, a hidden bias training is mandatory at the CBC. That's going to become illegal. I, I can't figure out what is unhealthy about hidden bias training being required of all employees of the national public broadcaster. That I just may have that radical opinion. So I'm concerned about uh, the bad rap that EDI is getting at this moment. I'm concerned about residential schools' denialism uh, that we are sort of debating. Maybe this wasn't true. Maybe these schools really didn't exist. Maybe they weren't as bad as uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is making out. I'm concerned about privatizing the health care system and the amount of murmurings that are made about that. And I was just in the Central Reference Library a few days ago, and they had up a very big sign that said, Ignite Minds, Not Books. I think that's, that's a good sign. <laughs> um, so those are just uh, four attitudes that are circling around in the uh, universe at the moment, in the Canadian universe. Uh, we know about the echoes uh, in my home state of uh, Texas. It's no longer permissible to teach about slavery. <laughs> uh, and when I think how long it took for there to be teaching about slavery in Texas and in other southern states and other northern states. How long that took, and now it's been reversed. I throw up my hands in despair. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, and maybe we can talk about this. All right, <laughs> outstanding. Maybe I have a, several questions. Uh, first of all, I must say that you have done an outstanding job turning the slogan, Ignite, not, Ignite Minds, Not Books, into a book <laughs> that ignites minds. Oh, and, and, and I find it really inspiring reading it and the profile of the sort of, re, you really perform it on the page of these 13 individuals that you uh, focus on is exceptional as, and I indicated, should be a compulsory reading for every Canadian probably high, uh, graduating from high school. The, what I find really amazing as an American becoming Canadian, originally Iranian becoming American and then Canadian, I, what I find really interesting, there are several ideas that you had already discussed about. One is that many Americans who came to Canada, they considered themselves as immigrants, not exiles. And I wanted, I'm wondering whether you could exp discuss this a little bit, open it up a little bit for our colleagues here and people who will uh, see this presentation online later. Yeah. And what did the, the sense of belonging to Canada, they came here to belong to Canada, and, and the kind of inspiration that they had, the kind of energy that they brought, the kind of devotion that they brought. They came here to create the land of liberty that they didn't see across their borders. Yes, uh, all of the people in the book 
have made and are making uh, outstanding contributions to Canada. Uh, one of the criticisms, in fact, of the book has been that I am dealing with very elite people. And uh, what elite turns out to mean um, is uh, people who uh, are involved in the arts, in universities, uh, in medicine, in, in one case. Um, but that, that, that intention to, um, to make the best contribution they can make was definitely a unifying characteristic of the people in the book. Um, sometimes their contribution is uh, really bad news for Canada. I talk about Sylvia Hamilton, mm -hmm. who's a wonderful filmmaker in the uh, Atlantic and taught at King's College for quite a long time. So Sylvia, uh, who worked for the NFB before that, um, Sylvia has a film called The Little Black Schoolhouse. And if you've never seen it, uh, it, it, it will be, I, I think it's on the NFB uh, website. And when I first saw this film, I wanted to deny what was in it, which is that there were segregated schools in Ontario and Nova Scotia just as long as there were segregated schools in the U.S. South. So the first place that I lived, was in southwestern Ontario, where one of these schools was. And I didn't like the idea at all <laughs> that uh, down the street from me, or down the highway, um, was a segregated school in Ontario, where there's only the good, the true, and the beautiful. And I was almost annoyed at Sylvia uh, for uh, telling me this. But uh, it's like residential schools. You have to admit the problem before it can get anywhere near a solution. So um, yes, the, the profiles are of people who came here because of some kind of a crisis in the United States, uh, like my Florence James woman who's the, the one I know the most about because I did work on this story one way or another for 40 years. Um, they came here because of some kind of a crisis. They stayed even when they could go back. That's most noticeable with uh, Vietnam resistors. Um, so they stay. And they work on stuff in Canada and make enormous contributions. Some contributions uh, may be disturbing. Um, you have already mentioned it, but I want to bring this also out. Another key concept that you have is the concept of parallel narratives. Ah. And the parallel narratives of Canada as land of inclusion, land of free, and then there are historical and political black blind spots and selective amnesia that you mentioned. If you could also explore this a little bit further. That uh, is a Sylvia Hamilton term. Uh, I didn't invent it. That is parallel narrative. Um, so uh, her people are um, uh, uh, from the War of 1812. And uh, I don't know if you've ever encountered uh, black people from Nova Scotia whose history is not the Underground Railroad. Uh, they become terribly upset when people say, where are you from? Because they're from here. <laughs> and they've been from here for uh, seven or eight generations. 
uh, so they get very annoyed about that. Anyway, Sylvia considers in many of her films and her artwork that she is telling a parallel narrative. Uh, but um, uh, a, a heartwarming thing for me, um, I, I, I tell in the book about um, doing a presentation at a uh, very well uh, respected uh, private girls' school in Toronto about 30 years ago. Uh, a number of media people, uh, including me, were invited to do presentations at this girls' school. And I start out by, I'm talking to a class of 15-year-olds, and I say, um, look at uh, this week's TV Guide. It's, it's Black History Month, actually. Look right. at um, this week's TV Guides. That was when we had TV guides. Um, the one from the Globe uh, is featuring a series on the Underground Railroad. And the one from the Star is featuring a series that, among other things, talks about slavery in Canada. And these girls start to riot. <laughs> and they tell me, that, there is, that there's never been slavery in Canada. I'm totally mistaken. Um, they go to a very good school, and they had a very good history teacher. And uh, the slavery in Canada has never been mentioned. I didn't intend this to be the point of what I was saying. But I literally could not get beyond that. So here's the heartwarming part of this story. Uh, last week. I was asked to be a guest in two education classes uh, at Lakehead University. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm the chancellor at Lakehead, which is uh, a ve really very wonderful opportunity to uh, meet with all kinds of people on all kinds of issues. So the class, the education class, is um, doing their uh, lesson plan projects. So in one class, the lesson plan for Black History Month for grade six, <coughs> as presented by these Lakehead students, was slavery in Canada. Great. And I thought, well, <laughs> well done. now uh, not only do these students know that there was slavery in Canada, <coughs> They are planning to teach it to grade six. I did warn them. I warned them. Uh, after I covered them in compliments and glory for their lesson plan, which was wonderful, I said, you might need to be in the school a few years before you unveil this one. <laughs> Just be cautious. Very good. And I have several other questions, but we are running out of time, and I'm certain that you have a question. Professor Jenkins? Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry I came in late. I'm actually one of the organizers with Mohammed. Ah, um, I'm a senior fellow. Right. Here. I'm, I'm Jennifer, so I'm also an American refugee, <laughs> as is Mohammed. Um, and I hadn't thought of using that, uh, that word. I, I like it, though. Um, and really appreciate a lot of what you're saying. But I just, uh, on this point, just last week, you know, um, oh, thank you. Just last week in um, just seeing it on CB24 that the teaching of black Canadian history is now going to be mandated in Ontario. And this is a huge step forward. Huge. Um, a long, I mean, it's long overdue here at the U of T in, um, in the history department where I am. And Mohammed is, and down at University College, there's now Black uh, Canadian Studies program with a certificate of Black Canadian Studies. This is also new as of, I think it's about just shy of a year old. It's brand new. So um, good developments happening. Just wondered what you, this mandate, that it's being mandated for Ontario schools, I thought was a really important step. It yeah. is a really important step. Uh, now, I see it doesn't happen until 2025. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And uh, 
that I, I have no idea what the background of 2025 is. Um, it, I had a brief acting gig uh, very recently. The Myceum, the Toronto Museum, mm -hmm. decided to, for Nui Blanche to do profiles of 52 uh, Toronto women who had made various contributions throughout time. So some, they were using actors because some of these uh, women are no longer alive. Uh, m many of them were. Uh, so the person I was acting, um, Rosemary Sadler, who was the uh, longtime president of the Ontario uh, Black History uh, Society, so she was my person. I'm being Rosemary. Rosemary has been talking about mandatory black history education for probably 40 years. Uh, so it, it, it has been a very long time in coming, which doesn't mean um, that, it's, <laughs> that that's bad. Good, good that it's happened. Uh, the 2025 thing worries me a bit uh, from a political point of view, uh, because so many things can change in that length of time, uh, just like we have gone from, in a very short space of time, from isn't EDI something that people should have to maybe we need people to prevent them from having it. Um, so, yes, um, a lot can change. Please, sir. Uh, uh, let me ask a sort of a hypothetical question in the context of your observation at the Toronto Public Library the other week where you saw a sign that said, uh, ignite minds, not books. So let us suppose um, someone has written a book um, disapproving, being very critical, saying it has no place and so on, of the DEI movement. And the Toronto Public Library perhaps says, well, that's not a, an appropriate book for our, our collection. Um, how would you handle that criticism from someone who's a sort of opposed to DEI and says, you know, don't condemn my, my book, Ignite the Minds, let people analyze my arguments and so on? Or um, would the, anyway, how would you deal with that? Because you're start, you, you know, one hears a lot of that sort of criticism now. Very good. Um, now, do you mean how would I deal with it if I am the library? <laughs> no, just or how, as how, a sh how, should, how should, well, how would you deal with it? How should society deal with it? Somebody says, I have, I'm writing a book, I'm passionately opposed to DEI, um, and the person, you say, well, that's not a good book, and they direct you to the sign on the wall at the library. Ignite minds, hmm. don't ignite books, don't destroy books. Hmm. So the library's got the book <laughs> in, in your scenario. Yeah. And, and I would be for <laughs> the library having the book. Um, whether I, as an individual, would be able to get into um, debate about the book, I'm not sure. Um, I probably would be able to. Um, and by the way, there's, there's gotten to be uh, a new initial. So there's equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization has started to be in some people's nomenclature. And um, I think this is a very good addition. 
but uh, is it, could I get into conversation about uh, a book that had a negative view of EDID, the answer is probably, <laughs> probably. Um, I'd have to, uh, of course, read the book first and, um, and, and, and see if that was something that I could uh, take on. I, I have tried. Um, I have noticed that there are people in the world who are much better than I am at dealing with opinions they disagree with. So I took uh, a course uh, in bystander training that my one of my two unions, Canadian Actors' Equity Association, was offering. And uh, because my, my tendency had been to uh, say, oh, you think this, that, and the other thing? Well, go jump off a cliff, and that's the end of you. And I noticed that there were people who did better than, than that. And we learned some of those techniques in the bystander training. So I'm pleased to announce that after I took the training, I dealt with a rather contentious issue where I disagreed with everything, and I got compliments on how I called the person in instead of calling them out. Yeah. So I well, learned a little something. Al along that line, what do you think of the scenario of getting the book and creating a vigorous public discussion and debate that Rather than creating heat, creates light. So bring opposing mm -hmm. points and have them debated in a rational and free conversation. The kind of things that we do on campus quite often. Rather than sort of pushing something away, we welcome it, we bring opposing ideas and say. Of course, that gets into the whole discussion about cancel culture. Yeah. Well, but, but yeah. It, it, again, uh, the, the public debate, open public debate, public enlightenment is something that I, while sharing all of your ideas, I am also committed to this open public discussion, not the kind that Donald Trump is <laughs> promoting, that using as a show, showmanship, but really public enlightenment, if that's the goal it would be the best thing to do. Bring the opposing ideas, have a vigorous discussion of it, and have the people decide. Yeah, more, more discussion, not less. Um, yes, we have uh, other questions, yes. I was wondering if you would like to distinguish For online, between immigrants and refugees. I get it. I think everybody heard me. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what is the online they want to recommend? It's a uh, recording. It's give you a little more time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's I was wondering if you would like to distinguish between immigrants and refugees. There, there definitely is uh, a distinction. I, I do cite in the book the, the uh, definition of refugees. Um, and say that uh, some people fall into that category, even though there's nobody in the book who has actually been admitted to Canada as a refugee. But there are people in the book who feared for their lives, their political safety, um, their um, their livelihoods. Uh, uh, when I talked about my, the woman who was my first inspiration, uh, she was completely ruined. I mean, completely. Uh, those, those people uh, 
in that Washington State Committee on Un-American Activities, uh, actually, um, the, uh, a play I wrote about her was produced in 2010 in the theater that had been expropriated by the university. And so it was the first time that story was being told because this, these people were completely wiped out. Now, she wasn't admitted as a refugee to Canada. She was an immigrant. But um, uh, I guess I'm, I'm saying that uh, some of these immigrants do fall under the classic definition of refugees. Thank you. Um, any, any final points? I know, I know we have run out of time. OK, I have to close. Uh, Dr. Deborah, uh, thank you very much for your outstanding book, for meeting with us, and your lifetime commitment to social justice and to making Canada a better, inclusive, and hate-free place to live. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. <laughs> I